I'm going to individually introduce our 2013 Lieutenant Governor candidates. The first candidate is Jean Marie Davis. And you can clap now. The next candidate is E.W. Jackson. Uh, 
Um, we'll begin, and the questions will go down the line. Candidates, so Senator Openchain will, will answer first down the line, and then the next person to answer first will be uh, Delia Bell on, on down the line. Um, our first question is about budget transparency. Do you support Senator Ralph Smith's bill, uh, budget transparency bill, to allow 48 hours? May I make an inquiry? Yes, sir. Were we supposed to get a one minute vote? Oh, I apologize for that. <laughs> Senator Overchain. Well, thank you very much. Uh, yes, I support Senator Smith's. Uh, <laughs> it is great to be with you. Uh, in my one minute, I'll be judicious. Uh, my name is Mark Ovenchain. I represent the Shenandoah Valley in the Senate of Virginia, have for 10 years. I believe that I'm a great candidate for Attorney General because we need somebody who's going to stand up to an overreaching federal government. 25 years of law practice and managed law firms. I've been a fighter. I've fought in the Senate for voter ID, for property rights, against uh, organized labor and uh, mandatory project labor agreements for education reform. I believe that it is no longer enough for us to draw a line in the sand and say that we're not going to give up any more of our freedom. I believe that it's time for us to start pushing back and fighting to expand the realm of freedom that we have in this nation. That's why I'm running for Attorney General. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Rob Bell. I'm also running for an Attorney General. Let me just say, the first job, the most important job of the Attorney General is to defend and protect this. This is our Constitution, and if you want to know how hard I'll fight for this, look at the Property Rights Amendment. Now, the story of that was the Supreme Court said the government can take eminent, excuse me, can take property from one person and give it to another through eminent domain. We fought back. We said that has to go back in the Constitution. We need property rights back. I had a resolution in 2007, failed. Tried again in 2009, failed again. Tried again in 2010, failed a third time. It was the fourth try that we had a big coalition get together. I was in the House, Mark was in the Senate. We had Democrats helping us, and it passed by one vote. Came to you all. You endorsed it, and it's back in the Constitution where it belongs. I'm a prosecutor. I'm an Eagle Scout. I would love to be your next Attorney General. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Susan Stimson and I'm Chairman of the Stafford County Board of Supervisors. I've been married to my husband Dan this September for 20 years. He's a retired Marine, was enlisted, went to the Naval Academy, we met my senior year at Mary Washington. Spent the first 15 years of our marriage, I was a military spouse. And it certainly helped shape me for uh, what I'm doing now in governing. Uh, Republicans, we have a problem. We have a Republican Governor, and Governor McDonald, the Speaker of the House, and Speaker Bill Howell. And we have Senator Norman in the Senate. We can control all three houses. What was the Republican answer? Finally, the transportation, we raised taxes. And we expanded entitlements. I'm going to be a change agent. I'm going to push back and speak out on this overreach into our personal liberty. Because I believe a limited government keeps the power where it should be. And I have a record of doing that in Stafford County. We've cut our pay by 25%. We've cut taxes three years in a row on real estate. We eliminated an owner's business tax, and we've been very successful in thriving on that for Virginia. Good evening, everyone. I just want to thank you all for coming out tonight. I want to thank uh, all of you for organizing this event. My name is Corey Stewart. I am the chairman at large of the Prince William Board of County Supervisors, uh, which means I'm directly elected by all 425,000 residents of Prince William County as chair, I'm the, uh, uh, which is the second largest county in the state. I've been governing Prince William County since 2006. Uh, during that period of time, I've got a record of accomplishment, of cutting spending by $143 million, of eliminating 320 government positions, and reducing Prince William County tax bills to the lowest level such that they are 30% lower than those in Fairfax County and neighboring Loudoun counties. I also led the nation's toughest crackdown on illegal immigration. These are not just words for me. I believe in leading by accomplishment and getting things done. I believe that that's what people want. I believe that that's what Virginians want. And that's why I'm asking for your vote and your support on May the 18th. Thanks a lot.
came to the sky and roamed today. Right? And what was, how did they describe the new pope? Compassionate, conservative, reformer. Well, when the smoke comes out of the Colosseum in Richmond on May 18th, I hope that they say the very same thing, compassionate, conservative, and reformer. Folks, if you like the political status quo, you're not going to like me very much. I'm Pete Snyder. I'm an innovator and an entrepreneur. I not only started a company that created hundreds of good-paying Virginia jobs, I started an entire industry. But I've been a soldier in our conservative movement for the past 20 years, starting with Ali North's Ali's Army in 1994, to fighting in the movement for life with the Susan B. Anthony list, to fighting the liberals on Fox News. Folks, I want you to get to know me over the coming weeks, and I ask for your vote as a delegate on May 18th. Thank you so much. I consider uh, a compassionate conservative uh, reformer to be uh, triply redundant. I'm um, a compassionate conservative. I think that's uh, consistent. In any event, I enjoyed my drive here to Rolo uh, through the Piedmont region across the uh, Blue Ridge here to the Roanoke Valley. Uh, I've been in the legislature for some time. I was raised in a rural Virginia, a family of eight. I have been privileged to first be elected in uh, 20, a little bit over 25 years ago. Uh, Ollie North, yeah, I worked on that campaign, but I was invited into Ronald Reagan's office to have a picture taken with him to use on my first campaign. So, uh, so there you go. And I've been consistent throughout the years. Even such you can look at my record and see the consistency. I'll know what I'm doing when I'm elected as, as Lieutenant Governor, and you'll be able to count on how I'm going to conduct myself there. I, in fact, was the one uh, in working with the others here, passed Senate Bill 1 that requires you show your idea at the polls, and I'm the one that put pen to paper and wrote the two sentences of the, the sentences that became the Health Care Freedom Act that Ken Cuccinelli took to the Supreme Court. Good evening, folks. I'm Scott Langenfelder. I'm a retired Army colonel, married to my wife, Shelley, for 33 years. Went to the Virginia Military Institute. In 2013, you have a tremendous choice. You've got very sincere people that are running for lieutenant governor. Ask yourself this, who has the leadership? I've been a leader for 28 years, 12 years in the General Assembly. I'm the chairman of the, the Militia Police and Public Safety Committee that killed all of the liberal gun group grabbing bills this year. Conservative. I have a 100% rating from the Family Foundation, the American Conservative Union, the National Federation of Independent Businesses, and an A-plus from the NRA. And I have a record, not just a brochure. I'm the guy that carried many of the reform bills that found the $1.4 billion in VDOT. There's no such thing, folks, as a self-butchering hog. You have to bring in an outside set of eyes to really get after this waste. I look forward to your questions tonight. I know I can get elected. I know I'll be a strong conservative for Virginia. Thank you. Folks, this election is about one thing, freedom. It was a Virginian who fought for our freedom, named George Washington. It was a Virginian who coined the words of the Declaration of Independence. It was a Virginian who said, give me liberty or give me death. It was a Virginian who gave us the Virginia plan that later became the Constitution of the United States. And folks, freedom is what this election is all about. We have got to show our country again what freedom looks like and where better to show them than the place where freedom's foundations were first laid right here in Virginia. If you elect me as your lieutenant governor, I will be a champion for freedom all across this commonwealth. And remember, freedom is not black or white or brown. It's not male or female. It's not single or married. Freedom appeals to the dignity of every single individual. And that is how we unite Virginians and make this state what it ought to be. Jackson and I get to do it all night long. Um, my name is Dean Marie Davis and I am also a candidate for Lieutenant Governor. Now I think that experience is very important. One of the reasons that you know Ken Cuccinelli is ready to leave the state as governor is because he's served in the state senate for eight years and he's been our attorney general. Well I'm the only candidate for Lieutenant Governor that has that comparable experience. 
I served in the State House for six years and was elected majority with my third term. Then I went to the State Senate where I was the only Republican woman and the only pro-life woman. I like to give some of my scores too. I have a zero with the National Organization for Women and a zero with NARAL. <laughs> the past three years I have, been chair I have been a member of the Governor's Cabinet leading the Washington office where I've been in the front lines fighting against Obamacare and his encroachment on states' rights, whether it's in education, transportation, workforce development, all of the areas that he thinks he needs to tell the states how to do their business. And so I'm the only candidate running that has executive branch experience, Washington experience, and legislative experience, and I think that I bring those qualities to the table, just as Ken Cuccinelli does, and I think together we'd make a great leadership team. Thanks so much for being here today. Yes, absolutely, transparency in government, especially when it comes to the budget, is first and foremost a priority.
where I agree, of course, I would support it and do support it, but for a slightly different reason, this is going to be add a different reason, and that is, you know, it's my observation with all due respect to the vast experience of my colleagues who spent a lot of times in politics, a lot of time in politics, you know, the people really are smarter than most politicians. <laughs> and, and, start, and politicians, would listen, politicians would listen a little bit more to the people. They would find themselves making much, much wiser legislation. There's a reason why the grassroots have arisen. Keep it up, folks. Well, congratulations on a very good piece of legislation. I think that that is um, well thought through, and of course, I would support it. I think there are a couple of other things that we need to do in addition to that. First, zero-based budgeting. What we seem to do is we take last year's numbers and we just use that and move forward, and it doesn't give us an opportunity to prioritize. And when budgets move from year to year to year, we're looking at the same priorities that we looked at 20 years ago. And we need to reprioritize every single year. Secondly, I would like to see a performance-based budget where instead of having line items and numbers, you have a paragraph under each line item <coughs> describing exactly what that dollars, those dollars are going to be used for. That's real transparency. every other piece of legislation we pass during the General Assembly session. It is the most important piece of legislation that we have during the General Assembly session. We do not see it until the last second. The budget is finally put together by ten people. Five people from the House, five people from the Senate, and very often we do not even have an opportunity to read it before we have to vote on it, much less giving you an opportunity to read it. It is wrong. Ralph is right. We ought to pass it. Thank you for giving great answers. Can we just uh, let the audience remember to hold the applause to the end? Uh, what are your thoughts on federal unmanned drone use on civilians? And we'll start with Mr. I think that drones in and of itself are not uh, an evil or a problem, but I think that it's those who are in power that abuse that power and that freedom and abuse it toward us. That's where the problem comes in. That's why it was so inspiring with Senator Rand Paul. Ask a simple question, Mr. President, do you have the authority uh, to have an unmanned drone to assassinate Americans on American soil? It took him a long time to get that answer. But what he did was he spoke up, and he pushed back, and he had his thinking about freedom, and people were inspired by that. Um, but those are my thoughts on drones that I have a great concern about an overreach of those in power. Well, absolutely not should they have access to those. They use those uh, drones or, uh, in the United States domestically. I find it frightening that the federal government even wants to use drones. They bought 1.5 billion rounds for, de for Homeland Security. That's for use in the United States. 1.5 billion. Why would you buy 1.5 billion rounds for Homeland Security for domestic security? Can you imagine? That's a war. That's not security. They're also and purchased 2,500 MRAPs. Those are mine-resistant vehicles. There's something going on. It's pernicious and it's dangerous for the Obama administration. I love drones. <laughs> when they're killing terrorists on foreign soil. <laughs> Not here in the United States of America. Folks, we all know that our Constitution is being shredded by Washington right now. Absolutely shredded. The Second Amendment, the First Amendment, and the Fourth Amendment, and many others. I, I too was inspired, and I think an entire nation was inspired, and C-SPAN probably got the highest ratings they had in eons when Rand Paul took to the well of the Senate uh, and inspired an entirely new generation. Drones should definitely not be used as a part of a strike force against our people. And for the reasons already articulated by both Corey and he, I do not trust this president. Often the tools that we have at our disposal 
Uh, it's dependent upon the trust of those in office, and you can't trust uh, this one or possibly the next one. So no, they shouldn't have such tools available to you. They're all correct. <laughs> and I would tell you that being in the military for a long time, military weapons are to be used against our enemies, not our citizens. We don't use artillery against our citizens. We don't use the M1 tank against our citizens. We don't bomb our citizens. And we shouldn't pry into their privacy and into their lives and into their freedom by using these kinds of technologies. If you want to secure our borders, that's a novel idea. Then why don't you try that? If you want to stop international terrorists from bringing things in, including drugs, to America, that's a novel idea. But honestly, we have an administration in Washington that is utterly clueless when it comes to the Constitution and our civil rights. Rand Paul is a hero. He's a hero. And folks, what's wrong with the Republican Party and why we have a Tea Party is the people like John McCain and Lindsey Graham turned their ammunition against Rand Paul for standing up for our constitutional rights and divide the Republican Party instead of uniting us. Thank God for the Tea Party, and thank God for those who are standing up to bring us back to the values that the Tea Party represents. One more thing at the end is everything's been said, but one of the things that I want to point out is the encroachment on our civil liberties, not just in the case of drones, but things like facial recognition, which we had to grapple with back when I was in the General Assembly. Um, the gathering of intelligence on our own citizens. I think those are all related issues and issues that we need to take seriously. Um, there is no reason to gather that kind of intel. Using it for public safety and in, in line with criminal activity is one thing. But when, you're, uh, when you are using them towards upstanding citizens, that's just wrong. And I think we need to be very watchful, not just for this situation, but the others that I just mentioned. You know, our founding fathers uh, wrote the Constitution and established the Bill of Rights at a time when uh, nobody could have possibly conceived of aircraft, much less drones. Uh, it is a complex issue that raises a myriad of, of concerns. Rand Paul did a great job on the uh, floor of the United States Senate addressing circumstances that need to be considered in establishing a policy. Uh, it, we should not allow drones to be used by the federal government for routine surveillance or to fly over our farms in the Shenandoah Valley, the Roanoke Valley, or elsewhere. We need a firm framework to make sure that our Fourth Amendment rights are protected. The Fourth Amendment reads, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated Look, this is a, it's a Fourth Amendment issue. If they want to listen to your phone, they have to get a court order. If they want to come in your front door, they've got to get a search warrant. But to park a drone over your backyard and look down at everything that happens would have been legal. Now, the good news is we did pass a law this year that said there's a two-year moratorium on the use of it. That passed the General Assembly, at least in Virginia, we're going to have a two-year time to say, wait a minute, this is new technology, like Mark said. We've got to get this right. It's a Fourth Amendment issue. Thank you. What is your current NRA rating, if you have one, and what is your lowest NRA rating ever? Well, I've been governing the second largest county in the state for the last six or seven years, and uh, we, don't, uh, we don't get NRA ratings, but I can tell you uh, that there was an attempt to outlaw buckshot in Prince William County. It actually passed. It actually passed with my opposition. Uh, I rounded up the troops, went to uh, the... Uh, the NRA and the VCDL, uh, but I've got respect for both of them, and, and the very next week we got that thing overturned. Hey. And you know, I don't agree with a lot that happens in, in Hollywood, but I do agree with what Bruce Willis said three weeks ago, which is if the Second Amendment falls, if we allow it to fall, all the other parts of the Bill of all the other rights, I mean the Bill of Rights, are soon to fall thereafter. We have to protect the Second Amendment first and foremost. lifetime member of the NRA as an executive and a technology entrepreneur. 
I don't have a scorecard, but I have a lifetime relationship with that organization for the past 15 years. I don't know if you've heard about Beretta and what's going on with Beretta right now, but in my day job, I'm a venture capitalist. And I read in the Washington Post that Beretta, based in Maryland, was thinking of leaving because Governor Martin O'Malley and the liberals in Annapolis are driving them out. Do you know what I did? I called up the CEO. I wrote him a letter. I invited them to cross the river to come to Virginia. We're a Virginia So let's bring them in and let's make Maryland a gunmaker free zone. I have an A rating with the NRA and a consistent solid record with them. I, uh, I own a gun since, uh, I've owned one gun since I was 12 years old that would be considered to be an assault weapon under the definition by, uh, because of its magazine size. Uh, but in any event, uh, solid record. I believe the best gun control comes when you can get a grip with both hands. Uh, and I've uh, done a lot of shooting throughout my life. Each of my sons and I have uh, a bit of an arsenal and uh, don't want to play. I have an A-plus from the NRA. Uh, and last week I, w I received the, the Carter Knight Leadership Award from the NRA for being the top state defender of the Second Amendment of the United States. I was preceded in that award by Senator Ted Cruz, so I'm very proud to have received that award. Uh, I uh, got one gun a month repealed uh, in Richmond, fought for several years to do that. As I mentioned in our opening, I helped kill all the gun grabbing bills this year in the General Assembly. Gun control is, you control your guns, I'll control mine. Okay. I haven't held elective office, so I don't have a rating with the NRA, but I've got a marksman rating with the United States Marine Corps. <laughs> and say, you're a minister, you're a man of God, how do you feel about the Second Amendment? I say, if you try to hurt me or my family or come at my home without authorization, I will shoot you and then I'll pray for you. <laughs> and the Second Amendment absolutes. It's a fundamental human right, and the Constitution doesn't give it to us, it only recognizes it. six years, so it's been a long while since I've been in. I will tell you that I'm a gun owner. I owned a 357 Magnum and I knew how to use it, and a Beretta as well. And when the alarm went off in my house when that my husband was out of town, you can guarantee the first thing I did was grab that 357 Magnum and look for the, fortunately it was a false alarm. I will say this, when I was in the House of Delegates, I served in militia, police, and public safety. And there was legislation that I was always the deciding vote on. Because I voted with the NRA on those pieces of legislation when I ran for re-election, I was pictured in the crosshair of a gun. The Democrats would send that mail out over and over again saying she's too pro-gun, she's too conservative for Fairfax County. question is what? How many guns do I have? Okay. <laughs> I have an A rating. I have always had an A rating by the NRA. I have carried legislation including granting reciprocity to concealed carry permit holders. This year you saw and I saw the abuse by a New York newspaper that published the list of gun owners in uh, the state of New York. I put in a bill that passed the General Assembly this year rectifying the problem caused here in Virginia by the Roanoke Times when it published the list of concealed carry permit holders personal information. It is now exempt from the Freedom of Information Act because of a bill that I patron that is sitting on the governor's desk. I'm an A rating now, I've had an A rating for my whole career. I'm a gun owner, a concealed carry permit, I'm an NRA member, and I'm a member of the Right Banner Rifle and Pistol Club, which if you come up Dalmar County is the best gun club within about 14 counties. Let me just say, those who are opposed to us keep trying to subdivide gun owners. They have collectors, they have hunters, they have sports shooters, they have... Let's not let them. What happens when they divide us, we get weaker. We should all stick together. We all agree on the Second Amendment. We can fight as a group and win. Thank you. I'll just start by saying that I'm the wife of a United States Marine. So you can bet that we do own guns and I do know how to shoot. Uh, I also support constitutional carry, 
and I will be leading on that issue if elected as your lieutenant governor. But the fundamental right to bear arms is not just so you can carry a gun. It is that line. It is that hedge against tyranny. Fifteen years ago, I was at a wedding in Miami, and there was a family there. The grandfather was from Cuba. He said the first thing they did was they took away our guns. I will fight to protect your right to bear arms and the federal overreach of executive orders like President Obama. I will fight back on that as well. Next question. Is HB 2313, Transportation Tax Bill, a good idea? If not, and it is signed into law, will you support its repeal? Absolutely, yes, I'll support its repeal. That is a horrendous bill. The largest tax increase in the history of the Commonwealth. Why? We have absolute control of government in Richmond. And we're choosing not only to expand bigger government, to, but to pass the largest tax increase ever. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that politicians continue to tell us that transportation is our number one priority, yet when we have a $1.4 billion surplus, only $50 million, virtually nothing, goes to transportation. That's not right. I voted against 23, well, what do you mean? Uh, 23 13. I voted against it and uh, argued against it on the floor of the Senate. It has a constitutional problem within it. Uh, I would want us to keep the part that has us spending more in general funds for transportation, but the rest of it having to do with the increase in taxes and all, I would vote uh, to repeal it. Next question. I also voted no on the transportation bill. The governor personally called me and lobbied me to vote for it, and I told him, I said, I just don't believe that it's correct. I don't believe that's the approach we should take. Look. The general fund comes from your income tax, your sales tax, corporate taxes, these sorts of things. Folks, it's your money. The general fund is your fund. And if you want to use it for roads, then we ought to be able to use it for roads. But the Democrats love to lock it up so they can use it for their special programs. Enough already. If your priority is to use it for roads, then use your money that you've sent there for roads. We don't have to raise your taxes to do it. Folks, we can talk about repealing the transportation bill all we want, but the lieutenant governor, unless he represents you, and, and they know in Richmond that he represents you, he's going to be nothing but a figurehead. And I'm telling you, I met with the uh, governor's chief of staff to go on record and let him know, not only am I angry about it, but you're angry about it. And they said, well, you know, we're hearing from a lot of people that they admire what the governor is doing and they admire what the General Assembly has done. Folks, they've got to hear from you, and you've got to have a lieutenant governor who they know speaks for you, and then we can get that and a whole bunch of other junk repealed. Um, there are clearly a few problems, more than a few, but there are specific problems with this legislation. You've heard a lot about it now, right now. The first thing that we have always been trying to do, as many of us as Republicans, is to put a lockbox around our transportation dollars so they can't be taken from the transportation fund and used for other reasons. And when I was first elected, Governor Gilmore actually had a budget that allowed that took the money from the transportation fund and put it into the general fund and replaced it with debt. And of course, I voted against that budget. I think that there are two unconstitutional provisions in this legislation that have got to be corrected at the very outset. And I think it's wrong to count on congressional action to determine how you're going to move forward with transportation funding. And I think that needs to be taken from that bill as well. A couple of things. Number one, the tax bill should be repealed. Look, we uh, last year had about a $500 million surplus. Of that $500 million surplus, you know how much we spent on roads? Not one red cent that came out of that surplus for roads. How can you claim it's a priority when we can't even spend our surplus dollars on transportation? Number two, there may be a constitutional issue with that. There's an article in the Washington Post last week by Norm Leahy and Paul Goldman addressing the constitutional issue. Third, we have 
budgetary problems in which we're giving money, $500,000 this year is in the budget for things like the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame. I love sports, mind you. I'd even pay admission. But we're spending money on things like that instead of roads. <coughs> I voted against the bill when it first came through. I voted against the final compromise. I opposed every single version or amendment that would have raised your taxes. This bill is a mess. It has a tax increase. That's bad enough. It doesn't lock up the money, which means even the tax money that is raised can go to other things. And third, it's dependent on the feds, the federal Congress, passing an internet tax. If they don't, they'll come back and raise your taxes again. It's a bad bill. I hope you'll contact the governor and ask him to amend it for better yet veto it. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, why would you believe anything that any of us here say? Why would you? We have all three houses of government in Virginia, and Governor McDonald and Speaker Howell and Senator Normand led the fight, the largest tax increase in Virginia's history. If we as Republicans do not draw the line in the sand on this assault on our liberty through higher taxes and expansion of Medicaid, then the Republican Party, I don't really care what happens. Because it won't matter what we as Republicans say, we're not following through on what we say that we believe. And those who are in the legislature, a no vote is great. I want leadership. I want a change agent. When I was on the Finance Committee, I made sure we cut taxes and cut our budget. Ultimately, we must all be judged on what we accomplish, not just on words. We had to be able to finance transportation, but it had to be done without raising taxes. In Prince William County, tax bills have been flat. But during that same period of time, I've been able to finance more than $300 million worth of our own road construction without increasing taxes. How? By cutting back in other areas, by shrinking and reducing the scope of government to get the job done without raising taxes. I would just wish we had the same type of leadership in Richmond. not for state, uh, Senator, uh, uh, state legislation. Uh, you can believe what I say up here because you can look at my record and see how I voted each time and what I tell you is what I did. And as far as change agent, you can look at the legislation that I've not only introduced, argued for, and got in So I think the most important term limiting device that we have is an election and you're it. You need to come out and throw people out who don't listen to you and follow and keep their promises as they've made them. That's number one. Uh, we do term limit uh, judges here in Virginia by law now. In other words, they're only in for a certain term. They have to come back. Uh, they have to be looked at again. And if they've done a good job, they get reappointed. If they haven't, some of them get pitched. So that's, that's a good thing. Uh, in states where they have had term limits, there have been some sort of spotty results. Where you've had senators run for the House and House run for the Senate, so you get into this sort of revolving thing. The best thing to do is to have a citizen legislature which you can vote at when they don't do what you ask them to do. And I think that is a great way to do it. Well, let's just be honest. Incumbency carries power. And the longer you are an incumbent, unless you do something so terrible as to incur the wrath of the people, the more difficult it is to dislodge you. You have the money, you have the name recognition. You know, George Washington limited himself. Uh, we don't see many George Washingtons these days. Um, it was James Madison who said, enlightened statesmen will not always be at the helm. Don't have a whole lot of enlightened statesmen these days. So we have to have term limits in order to cleanse the government 
of this incumbency disease that happens that causes people to be more concerned about how they preserve their career than what they do for our country and our commonwealth. Republican state senator in Northern Virginia lost their election. Every single one. Except Ken Cuccinelli. He won by under 100 votes and we lost his seat two years later when he became Attorney General. So I would have to agree that the voters do decide whether they want to keep people in office or not. And I'll tell you, when I was in the legislature, I got to know some legislators from Colorado and from Missouri where they have term limits. And do you know who runs their states? The bureaucrats and the lobbyists because they're the only ones with tenure. The only ones. So if you don't have longevity, if you don't have the ability for some people to be reelected, then the bureaucrats and the lobbyists run the government. And those are the very people you don't want running your state government. You know, at some point we are going to have to start seriously taking a look at the structure and at the possibility of imposing term limits. We've got an awful lot of people who stick that finger up and gauge the prevailing direction of the uh, current political breeze. And it's not to figure out how best to represent you. It is in order to figure out how best to stay in office. That is not public service. It is wrong. Judges, you know, we've got an obligation to you to make sure that we elect good judges. I practice law. I'm in courtrooms like Rob is uh, every week. And uh, our judges do a good job. They, for the most part, as they don't, we do remove them, and we remove people every year or two, and uh, you know it takes a long time to get a good judge sometimes, so uh, we need to uh, be careful about imposing two straight term limits. Okay, so I have Thomas Jefferson's seat, which means I have made peace with the fact that no matter what I do, I will not be the most famous person that ever holds the seat. <laughs> Y'all boss. If you want to have term limits, let's have them. I think that we ultimately are the employees. It's not really for us to say, no, you can't do it. So I would actually have no problem with it if that becomes the consensus of what we're going to do. On the judges, I think the Constitution of Virginia has them come up for review. It doesn't say for special cause. They actually come up for review. I think we actually can do a better job of reviewing them when they come on to say not just, are you doing okay? Have you avoided stealing? Have you done nothing bad? And actually say, are you still the best person for this seat that has so much power over our citizens? I think that's probably the proper, proper metric. I agree with a thorough review of our judges. And on legislators, how many government officials do you know who are willing to vote themselves less power? And what I love about what the grassroots has done with moving things forward into this convention process is that the field is now level. Money won't buy you a win. It's standing before you, the grassroots, and answering detailed questions like this so that there is an accountability. And as long as you have money, which ends up controlling people, and you keep the establishment in power through primary processes, which money controls, then the people have less of a say. schools the county there are more than 13,000 employees and let me ask you who the establishment is if you get rid of but your effective elected leaders such as Rolf Smith and others who've done a good job you put in newbies every single election guess who controls your government it's not your elected leadership it's not the leaders you chose it's the bureaucrats who have been there for years if not decades you have to think twice, and you've got to be very careful about imposing term limits. I come from the private sector. I don't think you should be doing this for a career. I think our founding fathers had it right that you get in, you make real change, and you get out. I'm not doing this to climb the ladder. We need good, conservative, principled leadership. And you know what? We have glimmerings, pockets of it in Richmond right now. But I think term limits would help us get even more. I think it's time to clean out some of the dead wood. It's clear we have some when we're increasing the size and scope of government and passing higher taxes, the largest in the history of the Commonwealth. Term limits are a great idea.
provided the first set of questions. We'll now move on to our uh, questions that were put together by our co-sponsors tonight. Uh, listen carefully, this one's slightly long candidates, so again. There are various set amendment preservation acts working their way through other state legislatures. They read in part, all federal acts, laws, orders, rules, regulations, in violation of the Second Amendment to the Constitution, are hereby declared to be invalid in this state, shall not be recognized by the state, and are specifically rejected by the state, and shall be considered null and void. In addition, any employee of the United States government who attempts to enforce these acts are in violation uh, of this act shall be guilty of a felony. Would you support such a Second Amendment Preservation Act for Virginia? I would, uh, because I think the Second Amendment, you know, it's interesting. People talk about the Second Amendment and they say it's about guns. Let me tell you something. If you don't understand that the Second Amendment is about your liberty, you have missed a huge civics lesson. And i got to tell you, you look at the folks out there who are coming after the Second Amendment. They're not standing with us on liberty. They want to prescribe our liberty. They want to limit our liberty. And I say to them, it's time to draw a line in the sand and say, take your confiscation plans and go somewhere else. Well, I carry not only the Constitution, I like to carry a copy of the Federalist Papers with me. Because it reminds us of how this government, the federal government, was formed by the states. James Madison, I'm looking at it right now, James Madison said that the states should resist, should resist, when the federal government goes beyond its constitutionally mandated limits. He called it a kind of madness. And so, yes, absolutely, nullification is something we have to look at, not only with regard to the Second Amendment, but with regard to all of our constitutional protections. all of us, but you know it's very important not just in this area, but in any area where the federal government is encroaching on states' rights and the, right, the states push back and say we're not going to do it. And we have a few examples of where we've done that. Real ID passed, where they wanted every state government to have their Department of Motor Vehicles make their driver's licenses a, a, a federal ID. And in Virginia we said no. If you want a federal ID to get onto an airplane have everyone get a passport, we're not going to do the real ID in Virginia. Obamacare, I think the state should say no. We're not going to do a health exchange in our states. You figure out how to do it. Um, and there's another one I can't even read. But there are, several, there are several examples of where we have said no as a state. And I think that we should always say no when we think that what the feds want to impose on us is the wrong thing to do. We have an administration in Washington, D.C. who showed a little respect for constitutional limitations. What we're talking about here in the second, the ninth, tenth constitutional, tenth amendments to the Constitution. We have got to have an attorney general who's willing to stand up and place himself between an overreaching federal government and the citizens of the Commonwealth of Virginia. I will fight to protect the citizens' rights here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Self-appointed civil libertarians cannot pick and choose which of the Bill of Rights that they choose to enforce and choose to believe in. I think all ten of the components of the Bill of Rights ought to be respected, and we have got to fight to protect our citizens' rights under each and every one of them. The Constitution has two limitations on what Barack Obama can do. It's got a list of enumerated powers. It's all he's supposed to be able to do. It's got a Bill of Rights that specifically says what he can. Our problem is that he does not accept the limitations that imposes in either direction. I will use every legal argument that we can find, every colorful legal argument we can find, to fight back against that. That's my pledge to you. Thank you. I think that I've spoken earlier about that right to bear arms that's not just so that you can have a gun, but it is that hedge against tyranny. And we now have President Obama, I think he's up to 23 executive orders that he wants to pass to infringe on your liberty, to infringe on your right to protect yourself and your family, not only from possible criminals, but also from an overreaching government. We have reached the point, without a doubt, of drawing the line in the sand and pushing back in any way possible through the courts 
through a strong attorney general, and as Senator Ted Cruz said, using every procedural means uh, necessary or available within our legislature to do so. Concept of nullification or interposition has been around since the 1790s. It was espoused by both Madison and Jefferson. It was, a, was opposed by Washington. But I don't think Washington saw or foresaw the explosive growth of the federal government and its, and its, its a overreach into the state's rights and the individual's rights. This is exactly what I've done in Prince William County where we, because the federal government refused to do it, we ourselves enforced federal law with regard to illegal immigration. We were criticized for stepping into the, into the area of federal government, but it's what you have to do sometimes to defend the rights of your citizens and your locality, and in this case, the state. So not only would I would do it, but I have done it, and I think we should do it more in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't the food chain go God, man, states, feds, right? Isn't that the order? And that's what it should be. I'm a constitutionalist. I believe in protecting to the hilt the Second Amendment, but every single other one as well, period. Absolutely. The preservation of our Second Amendment rights is, is essential to the preservation of all of our other liberties and all of the rest of the Bill of Rights. Without it, you cannot protect it. Um, as a matter of fact, I have experience in this regard. I am the one that took took the, t the pen and put it to paper and wrote the two sentences that became the Health Care Freedom Act. Uh, the majority leader in the House is trying to call me. Uh, but the, uh, <laughs> uh, and actually wrote the law that Ken Cuccinelli took to the Supreme Court. I served on the Federalism Task Force that, uh, that uh, George uh, Allen had in the mid-90s, in which we were pushing back even in the mid-90s, but absolutely in the beyond the constitutional bounds for the past 100 years, do you believe that the Congress has the capacity to, capacity to reform itself? If not, then what should the Commonwealth of Virginia do? Mr. Jackson. I, I believe that Congress has the ability to reform itself, but not without a very, very significant change, frankly, in the nature of the Republican Party. I think the Republican Party has got to become a party of principle again, uh, not this, this nonsense, amorphous stuff that we see going on now where we don't quite seem to know what we stand for and we're willing to go along with everything. I would also add this. Folks, our founding fathers believed that this is a providential nation, and I believe that without God, we're not going to correct the problems that we have. We need divine intervention. I can tell you that the federal government is hugely overgrown and I don't know how they wrap their arms around it either. I think the only way that the federal government or Congress can rein in the size of federal government is to pretend there isn't one and to start all over. And go through the list of priorities and say this is what we are supposed to be paying for. These are the services, national defense being the most important. And we shouldn't be doing anything else. The states should be doing it themselves. And unfortunately, I think that's the only way they can do it. As far as Virginians, what can we do? We have a U.S. Senate seat that's up for re-election next year. Let's find ourselves a darn good candidate and get that candidate elected. And that will be our, the first step in making a change in Congress. Does so Congress have the capacity to reform itself? No, it does not. You have the capacity to reform Congress. The people hold in their hands the ability to turn out and turn over every member of Congress. That is up to us to reform Congress, not up to Congress to reform itself. It's not going to do it. It is absolutely not going to do it. We have an Attorney General here in Virginia, Ken Cuccinelli, who's been pushing back on the federal government. So I believe that it is up to the people of the United States of America to reform Congress and for the states to stand up to an overreaching federal government and push back. The good news is, you don't have to look that far to 
to do what Mark just said. It used to be we blamed those idiots up in Massachusetts, those crazy people up in Vermont, those people in Minnesota. They're the senators who said they were the ones sending the senators who passed all these bad bills. I mean, Obamacare passed by no additional margin. They needed 60 votes, they got 60 votes. Does all everyone in this room understand the 59th and 60th votes were Mark Borders and Webb? Nobody is more responsible for this atrocious law than Virginia. That's the bad news. The good news is we can take care of it right here. We do not need to wait. We don't have to point fingers at somebody else. Everybody in this room can play a role. I agree we can do it. Thank you. Can Congress reform itself? Or another phrase that's funny, there's no such thing as a self butchering hog. Well, the people, we are the government. I am the government. When, and in my position, the government is the people, and I've been given the authority by the people to make decisions. And I can tell you, I don't need another set of eyes to come in and cut, because I believe the liberty and power should be in your hands. That's why I've consistently voted to decrease my power, to cut taxes, to cut our budget, to cut our personnel, to keep power in your hands. It's up to you to elect leaders who have the courage to follow through on what they say they're going to do, and I have the record of doing that. generation or so, the Republican Party, especially following a major loss as we did on November 6th, reevaluates itself. It remakes itself. We are the party of freedom. We don't have to change our policies. We don't have to change, rather, our philosophy. But we do have to go back, and I believe this is why we have a Ron Paul movement emerging. Young people coming in, because what they found is that our party has removed itself from its basic philosophy of freedom, of economic freedom, first and foremost. This is the result of November 6th. It is going to happen. It may take some time, but ultimately, we will reform government, we will reform Congress. But let's not change our form of government, but it will occur over time. Can Congress reform itself? I would argue yes, because I think our founding fathers had a pretty good formula. That said, it's driven by us. It needs to happen here. And I think we can all agree that politics as usual just isn't working right now. More of the same old, same old, and current politicians isn't working. I would argue that we need principled leaders, dare I say with real world experience, and that are outsiders that can help innovate and push our system to reform and get things done. That's what we need. Can Congress reform itself? Yes, but it lacks the will. You will have to force it. Um, as probably the only person up here that, that's slaughtered and butchered hogs uh, year after year in his life, uh, let me give credit to that line on our forums to my seatmate, uh, uh, Delegate Lingenfelter. He normally introduces us to that line every time we're together. But there is, in fact, no such thing as a self-butchering hog. You're going to have to do it. I've been seated most of the night, but I'm going to stand for this one. Folks, the opposite of progress is Congress. You need to remember that. <laughs> Um, look, it's already happened. Open your eyes. You saw Rand Paul on the floor of the House or the Senate last week. You saw Ted Cruz. You saw Mark Irvine. Folks, it's not hard. When you elect people of principle who are what they say they are and will do what they say they will, you will reform this nation. And I want to be that person for you here in Virginia as your lieutenant governor. Given the ongoing failure of the Congress, the Supreme Court, and the presidency to uphold the Constitution, given specifically the failure to repeal Obamacare in the past year, the drones in the sky, and American citizens being killed on demand by the president without trial, do you believe that we are past the point of last resort? If not, what exactly needs to happen for you to believe we are at our last resort? 
my goodness, what a question to answer in 30 seconds. Um, no, I don't think we're at the last resort. I think God's blessed this country since its inception, and God will continue to bless this country. Um, it's good, strong-willed people, like all of you out here, that, and, and, with, and people in every state in this nation who I think will come to understand, as time goes on, exactly the predicament that we're in. I'm a person of hope. I'm not a pessimist. I've always been an optimist. And I think that, that God has great plans for this nation. He always has and he always will. And by working together and joining hands, I think we certainly can overcome anything that this administration sends our way. Well, that was as disappointing as the elections were this past fall. And we had choices. We could stay at home. We could give up, cash in our chips, and declare the republic over and done. I'm not there. I'm here. I'm running for Attorney General of the Commonwealth of Virginia because I believe in the greatness of America. I believe that we can bring America back. I believe that America is the greatest nation on the face of the earth. It has had periods of greatness and that we will experience those periods again. I have the optimistic vision that Ronald Reagan brought. I believe in the creative capacity of the American people. We're going to bring it back. our challenge, isn't it? I mean, World War II, they were fighting the Nazis would have taken our power away in a single stroke. The great, we had the Cold War where the communists would have come and taken our power away in a stroke. This will not take it away in our stroke. Our freedoms are not going to go away like this, but they are going away drip by drip by drip by drip. And it's our challenge not to be the ones who look back to our kids and say, eh, we just kind of let it happen. This is our challenge. So I hope we're not feeling downbeat or depressed or distressed. Every previous generation that had a challenge like this rose up and overcame it. This is our challenge. Let's get together, work together, and make it happen. Thank you. The Founding Fathers talked about the two pillars on, upon which the Constitution and our nation needed to stand. That was morality and religion. And I think right now our country is going in the wrong direction. But there is a vacuum also of leaders. Leaders who are willing to have the courage to stand up and to speak for truth. Leaders who are not fearful or looking at their next election and deciding on the election and how they're going to vote. But I think that there is a hope for our nation. There's a hope of electing people who are seeking truth, people who are seeking to limit government and keep the power in your hands, and who have the courage to follow through on that belief. Some say that we've already reached our high watermark. I don't believe that's true. I think that generations of politicians poisoned with a philosophy that government is the solution to our problems has left our children and the young people out there with insurmountable debt, with unsustainable federal entitlements, and with a bleak economic future. But it will be up to you, you, young, to turn this around and it'll be up to us to start this process. And at that point, people will look back and will say that we, in fact, were the greatest generation. I believe that the high watermark for our country is yet to come. I'm an optimist. I was bred that way, my mom raised me that way. And I think America is a nation full of optimists. We have overcome challenges throughout the generations. This is just our latest. Yes, I do agree that America is at a crossroads. I do agree that the Commonwealth is at a crossroads. That's why I'm running. I actually had my own put up or shut up moment. I've been on the sidelines for a long period of time in, in politics, but I've spent my entire life in the private sector I thought, now is the time that we have to get in and we have to do something. It's up to us, folks. If we throw in the towel, yeah, our republic will probably go down the drain. But if we fight for liberty with every single fiber of our hearts and souls, and we bring ideas to the table, we will prevail. We will triumph, and God will allow that. Thank you. Uh, that failure is the price paid for success, the tuition paid for success. 
And there is a lot of uh, big price being built up by people who are making a lot of mistakes in Washington and in different levels of the government, quite frankly. But we can always make a difference. We're not defeated until we give up our last breath. And I can tell you that when I first ran, I ran against an entrenched incumbent that outspent me four to one. And the article the next morning with the headline was Kingslayer. Let me tell you what, you can do it. I'm thankful that the people have risen up on behalf. The solid majority is speaking out. Make it louder, get involved, make it difference. The founders got it right, folks. They understood that you had to win revolution, and we did. And so too did the Russians and the French and the Chinese, but all those failed. And they failed because they didn't do what our founders did. Having won revolution, they ordered revolution. And how do they do that? They did that through the Constitution. But there's a third corner to the triangle. It's called sustaining revolution. How do you do that? By what, doing what Madison said, a frequent recurrence to founding principles. This is what's going on today in the Tea Party and in other places where people are really driven to look at the Constitution and look back to our founding vision. When we do that, when we go back first, we will go forward best. Every single one of us in this room loves this country. And we love this commonwealth and understand enough of this history to know that this commonwealth laid the foundation for this country. And please listen to what I'm going to say closely. Every single one of us ought to have this attitude. If out of 315 million Americans, there's only one left crying for freedom, and I am that one person I will stand until I take my last breath. The Marine Corps didn't teach me to quit. They say you fight. You fight on until you win. And we cannot be defeated if we will not quit. If we give up on our country and we give up on God, then we've lost it all. But folks, I hope you'll join me in saying this is not a campaign. This is about a movement to restore this nation. And if there's nobody else left standing up for freedom, we're going to be doing it. frustration. We have got to express a positive view for America. We have got to stand up and express our opinions and our views about the greatness of this country, the opportunities that have been given to us, and fight for those same opportunities to be provided to our children. We've got to stand up for policies that promote individual responsibility because that is the right thing to promote strong families. Uh, to stand up and promote strong families. We've got to promote great schools for our kids so that they will have the opportunities that we've had as well. We believe in individual liberty, limited constitutional government, and more freedom because they are the right things. They are our birthright. They are going to be our children's and our children's children's inheritance. That's the message we have to take to America. that last question a little bit more. Uh, it's kind of downbeat. Again, the country is headed in the wrong way, but let's look back at the 2012 election and remember what else was on the ballot. The very same election where Barack Obama carried Virginia, the Tim Kaine carried Virginia, that property rights amendment was on the ballot. And remember what happened. This didn't have a face, it didn't have an R by the name, it just had this idea. And the idea was, we believe in the Constitution, we believe in property rights. That passed three to one. That passed three to one. But what that tells me is that it's not our message. It's not that, you know, when we say we're for the Constitution, the other side isn't saying they're not. 
There's something about the way we are expressing that message when we go out in the field. And part of it may be the candidates, that we're not, we, we candidates are not expressing ourselves enough. Or maybe it's that we're not tying it to the way people live their lives and making it all about big picture and they need it down at the lower level. But we've got to do a better job so that we can make these ideas which are successful be translated into the election victory so we can elect politicians and elected officials who can carry it out on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you. I'd like to get back to the question on can Congress reform itself? Can the General Assembly reform itself? Can your local government reform itself? And I believe that we the people are the government. I'm the government. You're the government. It's through the people's authority that elected officials make decisions. And by electing leaders who have the courage to limit government so that the power stays in your hands, that increases liberty. And true liberty allows us to be everything that God intended us to be. So the reason that we're fighting to protect these liberties isn't just because we want lower taxes or smaller budgets. It's because I, as a mother, I'm concerned about the freedom for my children. I'm concerned about their being able to make choices for themselves and for their families. So I do believe that Congress, the General Assembly, that your local government can reform itself because in Stafford County, the government did reform itself. We cut our pay, we cut taxes, we cut our personnel, so that we had less power and it stayed with the people. this together. And I also want to thank you all for the dinner last Saturday night, especially Mildred. Thanks very much. That was great chicken. Um, even better than my wife. Don't tell her that, but, uh, but it was great. I, you know, one of the great things that I love about Mildred, though, and, and so many of you, is you get things done. And I'm in Prince William County. I'm elected countywide. 425,000 residents. And with 57% for Barack Obama. And I've won it countywide three times. Why? Because when I ran for election in 2006 and I made promises to cut the budget and to crack down on illegal immigration, I kept those promises. I got the job done. What people are looking for is not just words. They're looking for leaders. They're looking for leaders that say things and then proceed to get the job accomplished, not come up with excuses about why they couldn't get it done. That's why I was re-elected in Prince William beating my Democratic opponent by 30 points, winning 72 out of 77 precincts. Because what Americans want, what Republicans want, what independents want, what even some center-leading Democrats want, is leadership, getting the job done. If you nominate me, not only will I win, but I will promise you to implement successfully a conservative agenda in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Around on the transportation question earlier. You know, it's really funny that whether it's transportation or education or you name it, if you read the newspaper or the editorial boards or what have you, they always frame it up the same way. It's constantly, we have a revenue problem. We have a revenue problem. Oh my gosh, we just have to raise more taxes. Then we'll have more revenue. Folks, I think we all know that Richmond doesn't have a revenue problem. That's a spending problem. A massive one. Over the past 20 years, population of Virginia has grown by 30%. Budgets have grown by 270. That's not just a math problem and an economic problem. It's a moral problem. And we need to address it. I also promised myself if I was going to run for office, I wouldn't be one of those classic doctor no candidates. No, 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 no. Well, what's your idea? So, when it comes to transportation, you know what we have to do when it comes to education? You know what we have to do? We have to prioritize. We have to have tax reform that streamlines our tax system. And then we have to do something that I think is fairly modest. We have to look at our budgets and roll back the size and scope of government by 10%. You would think that's audacious. I think it's modest. Yet I've been called naive to suggest that government can cut its budget by 10%. Folks, we do that. We'll have plenty of money for roads and schools and whatever else we need. Though I serve, though I serve on, and I want to do with budget transparency and, uh, and budget issues generally, and though I serve on more committees in the Senate than anyone else, and I'm senior to all but two, if I am not on the budget committee, 
because, and I will quote, I am willing to vote against budgets. Mark and I both were in a 23-person majority in the Senate when that 23-person majority, 18 of them, decided to create a different caucus so that they could keep us out and specifically and disinvited us from it. Because, why? Because we asked questions of them about the budget. They don't, they don't want that, and that's even Republicans, okay? Now the reason why, I, you know, the issue of truth earlier, but what do you trust? I speak the truth inside of our caucus and on the Senate floor, tr speak it to the Democrats, speak it to the Republicans. The reason why I got a letter from a lady who totally disagrees with me on life issues year after year, uh, and this one year four times, she sent me a letter saying, Senator Martin, I don't agree with you on that, but I th I'm so thankful you're my senator. And it's because of how I address the issues, and you can have confidence in it, and you can have confidence in me. Folks, I'm struck tonight by all the questions about Congress, and I'm proud of you. We came here to campaign about Lieutenant Governor and Attorney General. But I think you get it. I think you understand that liberty is being threatened like we've never seen. I often think, what would Ronald Reagan think if he were here today? For me, that guy was the high road man. And I think we need to go back and look at what he was doing in the 80s and really and truly emulate it today. Look, folks, this country was founded on the notion of the rule of law, the right to possess private property, and a common American identity. That's why I carried the Bonita Bill this year. That's why I carried the property bill that protects small farmers in Virginia. And we're not done with that. And I'm proud to have Martha Bonetta's endorsement. But I will tell you this, if we don't stand up for the rule of law, the right to possess property, and a common American identity, we have a huge problem. That's what Ronald Reagan would, have, would be saying, I believe, today if he were here. That's what we need to hear from our leaders all across this country. Well, I want to come back to the issue of nullification. Folks, we have some educating to do. Because nullification is a vibrant constitutional principle. But people will remind us that nullification was used by some states in the South in order to try to deprive black children of education and so forth. We need to remind them that nullification was also used to nullify fugitive slave laws for those who escaped from the South and ended up in a free state so that they wouldn't have to be taken back into slavery. Our founding fathers gave us these principles for a reason. They were to assure our freedom. And we've got to have people like Ronald Reagan who can articulate our ideas in a way that persuades our fellow citizens and brings them to our side. What most politicians do is figure out where people are and try to mirror that rather than trying to lead them to a better place. We need our citizens who are not in this room now, whatever their background, whatever their color, to hear what we're saying and to say what those folks are saying makes sense. I want to join with them. That's the kind of lieutenant governor I'll be. to share a story that's compelling for me as a mom. Um, I am the mother of four grown daughters who are 24 to 34, and my third daughter, Cassie, is an Air Force officer. She was in the ROTC program at UVA. She was home for a holiday during one of her breaks, and we were at the dinner table, and she said, you know, Mom, I'm willing to die for my country. That's something a mother doesn't want to hear her child say, but it was the most compelling thing any of my children have ever said to me as I have raised them. And I think that speaks volumes. Um, in addressing our last question about whether there's hope for this country, as long as there are young people like my daughter who are willing to give up their lives to maintain the freedoms that our founding fathers granted us in our documents, the Constitution in particular, then this country has hope. You know, I like to go back to the Civil War. Here's a war where Americans were fighting Americans. We had huge losses. Our population really declined, and we were in terrible trouble. But after that war was over, Americans pulled together and they rebuilt the country. And there's no reason that we can't rebuild this country when this president is finally ejected from office. Thank you so much for being here this evening.
let me just thank you for coming out. It's obviously a, a night you could have done other things, but you're interested enough in the way your country is headed to come and listen to us. Thank you. The Attorney General's job is what I wanted. Let me tell you, there's two sort of roles it has. The first is I think it can stand as a shield. And so long as Barack Obama is in power, you need that shield. You need somebody who's going to say, what is he doing? And I'll give up this promise. If you elect me, I will wake up each day, again, spread the newspapers out in front of me, look to see what he did yesterday. Is it constitutional? And if not, what are we going to do about it? That's the shield part. The second part is you need to play offense, too. Um, in the past, when an unconstitutional issue has come up, it can take many years and many efforts to try to roll it back. And an Obamacare is a good example. One vote. You're one vote away from carrying the whole day. Just think how different we would all be feeling if the entire statute had fallen by one vote. It didn't. Okay. Let's not give up. Let's continue pursuing other strategies. There's a religious liberties argument right now that's going through the course. There will be more. It took them 64 years to dismantle the separate but equal ruling by the Supreme Court. It was a very careful legal process. They built case upon case upon case until the whole thing fell. I'm certainly hopeful it will not take 64 years for us to dismantle Obamacare, but let's not wait. Let's start today. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, conservative governing works. But we as leaders, those of us who are in a position we need to be leading people to that vision. In Stafford County, I have a record of conservative governing. And I'm not sure why so many Republicans are struggling to actually follow through on that. That increased liberty allows us to be the best that God intends us to be. That's why I will fight for the unborn. I will fight for your liberty. And I will fight for your right, your God-given right, to pursue happiness. I also think that what we also need to do is to remember that there's a reason that we are in this battle and that we need to be able to engage and relate to the culture where they are today, to families that are just struggling to pay their bills. There's a reason that conservative governing is best for them. They just want to be able to provide for their families. And we know that the way to keep America the strongest is to allow families to be free and to do what we can to increase that freedom so that they can have jobs to take care of their families and to pursue their dreams here in Virginia and in America. Thank you. I can tell from the clapping that you're really ready to go home. <laughs> so I'm going to try to keep this a little bit close. I just want to wrap up and say a couple things. You know, when I got elected, Countywide, the second largest county in the state, Northern Virginia, and I said I was going to implement a conservative agenda. Nobody believed me. But we did. We got $143 million worth of spending, eliminated 320 government positions. And then when they told me we couldn't do anything about illegal immigration, but we did. We implemented the nation's toughest crackdown on illegal immigration, delivering more than 6,000 criminal illegal aliens over to the federal government for deportation, dropping our violent crime rate 48.7%. And then after I got that done, and Barack Obama won the county, and Prince William County became the first majority minority county in Northern Virginia, they said I couldn't win re-election. But I did, beating my Democratic, by Democratic opponent by 30 points, winning 72 out of 77 precincts. And now there are those who are saying that if we want to win another election, we have to move to the left, that we have to have embrace, embrace abortion and amnesty and gay marriage and all these and, and tax increases. They're wrong. We don't have to change our principles. Our principles are wrong. But we have to change perhaps how we campaign. We can no longer ignore certain parts of the state. We need to campaign all over. That is what I did because what I found, people might not always agree with you. But when you stick to your principles, you will eventually earn the respect and their vote. And that's what I ask from you, your vote and your support on May the 18th. Thank you all very much. As a job creator and entrepreneur, I've hired hundreds of people in my life. And I've never hired anyone because of their resume. Resume gets you in the door, but it's always, what are you planning to do? What is your vision forward that gets you the job? Folks, as a party, it is 2013. We cannot go back. 
We must, as a party, go forward. Our principles are right. But if you look at Ronald Reagan, he was relentlessly focused on the future. With me, you'll have a conservative, reliable, reform-driven lieutenant governor who's going to be focused on reforming our schools and getting choice and charter schools finally in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Secondly, on economic development, cutting the corporate income tax. And thirdly, reducing the size and scope of government by 10%. I'll close with this. I'm seeing in the crowd a lot of good friends, a lot of people who support me, but then also some folks who may be unsure or supporting someone else. I have a sticker on you for another candidate. I met my wife, person when she was on a date with another guy. So if you have some uncertainty about the Snyder character, or love in your heart for someone else, that is just all right. Get to know me. I will work hard to win you over. Thank you. Anyone who's not with you when you meet them is with somebody else or uh, are not with you when you meet them. So that's <laughs> 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 but, <laughs> listen, as a businessman of over 28 years, um, I, I have that business background. I came out of a large family, farming community, blue collar, hard working. I had the privilege of serving, though, in quite some years in the legislature. I have the experience, and I have a record you can look at that you can count on. In 1991, the Richmond Times Dispatch has said that I was one of the faithful five in the House fighting against both Malal's and Wilder's tax and spend and expansion of government efforts. They resurrected that title and used it in more recent years and more recent administration, given the exact same argument. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter to me whether you're Republican or Democrat leadership. If you're wrong, you're wrong. Despite the fact that I had the privilege of being assigned as uh, Bob McDonald's mentor when he was first elected, he invited me into his office and said, why are you dinging on me? And he told me what he needed out of me. I said, I can't do it. This is what I need out of you. If you can't give me this, this, and this, I can't vote with you. And so I'm willing to stand up. I have the courage. I'll tell the truth. And so you can count on me. I have the experience and the record that you can look at and you can count on. Virginians, when all the platitudes and the speeches are done, what will have become of liberty? In 1843, a young Massachusetts scholar was doing research on the surviving members of the Revolutionary War, and he found that Captain Levi Preston, who was 90 years old. And he said to Captain Preston, he said, so you were oppressed? He said, we were not oppressed. He said, well then, you were mad about the Stamp Act? He said, never paid a penny for one. Well, what about the tea tax? The boys threw it in the harbor before we got there, never got a drop of it. He said, what about Locke and Sidney and Harrington, the great writers of liberty? He said, the only books we had were the Bible, an almanac, as Isaac Watts had one. And by now, this youngster is very frustrated. He says, then why did you go out to fight? And the old boy gave these immortal words. We had always been free, and we intended to stay free always. And the Redcoats went our way. Folks, the Redcoats of our time want to take our Constitution. They want to take our rights. They want to take our property. And they want to limit freedom. As your Lieutenant Governor, every morning that I get up, I will stand against tyranny. I will stand for liberty. I promise you that. Just as I took an oath to defend this Constitution in combat, and as a legislator, I ask for your vote. Thank you so much for coming. God bless all of you. Ronald Reagan said, they call me the great communicator, but I'm not a great communicator. He said, but I do communicate great things, but they didn't start with me. They are the things that are in the hearts of the American people. And he said this, freedom is never more than one generation from extinction. We do not pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for and protected and passed on to them to do the same. Or we will spend our sunset years telling our children about the United States of America where once men were free. That cannot be our legacy. It is not an accident that this nation exists. It is not an accident that Virginia laid the foundations of this nation. And folks, in the 21st century, this prelude, this 
this intersection that we have with tyranny is to be the prelude to the greatest century in the country's history so far. We must make sure that America remains free and the fight must be waged here in Virginia. God will show us the way, Virginia must lead the way, and let's let liberty light the way. Thank you. Like you, I'm tired of losing elections. And I think our number one goal in November of 2013 is to elect Ken Cuccinelli, the next governor of Virginia, and the rest of the ticket. Now let's look at the result of the last election and what caused us to lose. You have to have 46% of the voter better in Northern Virginia as a Republican statewide candidate to win statewide. Romney lost Northern Virginia by 200,000 votes, and he lost Fairfax County, where I'm from, from 120,000 votes. I was elected four times in my district, and my districts had a 17-point Democrat generic. Only 25% of my voters were Republican. And yet I was elected four times, twice with 60% of the vote, even though I maintained a 100% pro-life voting record and voted for the marriage amendment, which failed in my district. And the reason I did that was I was able to reach out to and garner the votes of those who didn't vote for Romney this time, or Allen. When we looked to see why we lost, we did miserably with ethnic voters. We did worse with Asians than we did with Hispanics, which really surprised us because they tend to be Republican voters. I'm very proud to announce that on Saturday at noon, when our filing deadline closed in Fairfax County, I had filed over 1,000 delegates and 450 of them were ethnic voters. I have 50 East, Indian, East Asian Indians that are coming from Enrico, and we're signing up hundreds of Filipino and Asian voters in Virginia Beach right now. We will have hundreds of, of ethnic voters at this convention, which means we'll be engaging them in our nominating process. They'll be able to hear our conservative message and know that they agree with our party, not the Democrat Party, and I believe that'll be the first step in having those voters come back and vote Republican again. That's what I've been working on, and I know that I will be a great partner on the ticket for Ken Cuccinelli, and I can help him win in Northern Virginia. Thanks so much for your time, and I'd appreciate your vote on May 18th. state senator in Loudoun County named Mark Herring. He's running for attorney general as a Democrat. And he's traveling the state saying, we need to get the politics out of the attorney general's office. Allow me to translate that for you. He wants your politics out and Barack Obama's politics in. He would lie down on health care. He would lie down in the face of the Environmental Protection Agency. He would surrender our right to work laws. We cannot allow that to happen. We have to have an Attorney General who will stand up to the federal government. We have got to have an Attorney General with experience. We have to have an Attorney General who will fight and who has been and will be successful. I've successfully fought for and obtained passage along with Rob of our property rights amendment, which we fought for since 2005. This year we successfully got photo ID. Uh, we have gotten concealed carry confidentiality. We have gotten the first meaningful school choice legislation through. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is not enough for us to simply draw that line in the sand and say we're not going to surrender any more of our freedom. It is time for us to start pushing back and saying we are going to fight, we're going to scratch, we're going to kick, we are going to expand the realm of personal freedom for Virginians in this country. Ladies and gentlemen, I would love to have your support in my bid for Attorney General. God bless you. God bless the Commonwealth of Virginia. And God bless you.